Cool. Okay, great. Uh, we are live. Uh, welcome. My name is Alex Shrazi. Uh, let's see. Are we are we in the shot? Okay. Okay, great. Um, so let me go ahead and start this recording for the podcast, and we should be good to go. Um, so we're here with Brian Spears. He's the CEO and founder of New Age Meets, and it's actually very exciting because we're here at Indie Bio. And so, uh, uh, Brian, tell us a little bit about your background, and you just started a clean meat company, yep. and so tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into really starting a clean meat company. Sure, sure, yeah. So, my background shortly is, uh, so, Maryland originally, born and raised in rural western Maryland. I grew up working on a farm, actually, uh, and then I studied first biology and then chemistry and then physics, then found a chemical engineering. Uh, graduated in chemical engineering and started working for an automation, so industrial automation, research automation company in Austin, Texas called National Instruments. Worked for them for four years in, in engineering. And then myself and another guy co-founded a company called Six Clear. And that company uh, automated the research labs and production environments of <clears throat> some really good customers that we earned over the years. So we finally ended up with like NASA and some national labs like Sandia National Labs. Uh, so Cisco Systems and Siemens, things like that. So what our specialty was, was to walk into their labs and say, hey, you can make this whole process dramatically more efficient by adding more test points. You can then take the data and then understand why one part of the system affects another part of the system, and then understand like the mechanisms underneath the reactions that are occurring, things like that. All scientific labs. Yeah, so there's some deep research labs, and then there were also some product labs. So then uh, on the product side would be like Cisco Systems, for instance. So there would be like design and test engineers that we work with, and specifically it would be, so my job was to kind of lower the barrier between R&D and development, right? Okay. So you may have heard this paradigm of throw, throw a prototype over the wall. You have these designers and engineers that make a prototype, like of a phone, and they say like, here we go, now go make a million of these. They throw right. it over the wall to the production engineers, and then they use a different set of hardware and software in order to make a million of those. Now sometimes they say like, hey, you sourced a bad uh, part, so they throw it back over and make another prototype. So they, they make another prototype, they throw it back over. So that system is very time consuming. And so my career has been dropping that. So making right. instead an iterative loop between R&D and production. Right, so, okay. Cool. And so, um, so how did you first start thinking about, or when did you first hear about clean meat? And when did you start thinking about creating a clean meat company? Yeah, good question, right. So uh, I, I ran that company for eight years, so 12 years total in the industry. And uh, about, we'll say halfway through that time, uh, I started to ask these questions about, you know, what is the point of what I'm doing here, right? Uh, so in the beginning, it was, of course, we wanted to make money, but then we also wanted autonomy, right? We wanted to do our own thing and kind of forge our own path. And we had some great customers, um, but you, you start asking, like, well, what, what's the point of this company? What does it do, right? What, what's, what's my mission here? Uh, and then you'll start asking questions like, what is the mission of my life? And like, what am I doing with my time? Uh, so this was in my late 30s, I'm 40 now. Uh, and at that time it was just, it became clear to me that I needed something that, that provided that mission, right? So I had like nonprofits that I was involved in on the side, uh, but they often got the dregs of my time and energy. Uh, so the company was doing that. And so I thought, well, why not have the company and my personal time or my, my vision align. Why don't I do the thing that I think is going to make the most impact for the world in a positive way? So uh, I sold out of that company and then went on sabbatical for two years. Uh, I like sold a backpack to like Europe and Asia, and then I moved to Denver. Did a lot of hiking and camping by myself in the in the Rocky Mountains. So like a perfect day would be wake up and hike by myself and just think about you know the world, my role in the world, uh, and. You, you kind of have this three-way collision between what you're good at, right, <clears throat> and what your passions are, and then what the world needs, like what's the, what's the market for your skills, right? Uh, and so I thought about that for quite a bit, and I actually heard Uma Valetti, uh, so co-founder of Memphis Meets, I'm on a podcast, and so this was all uh, late 2016, and I became really involved with, or started to learn more about clean meat or cultured meat through the Good Food Institute and New Harvest, and uh, in early 2017, I started <clears throat> working more closely with them. I, I got on their entrepreneur network, which is called GFI Diaz, GFI Diaz, Portmanteau, and uh, essentially looking for a co-founder and saying like, this is my background, this is what I want to do. And so I was interviewing a bunch of co-founders 
And in November 2017, that's when my co-founder, now Andra, contacted me. So that's how we got into the space. Uh, quick background on her, she, had, uh, she just finished her PhD in molecular biology at Oxford, uh, in interdisciplinary biosciences. And so she was at an accelerator called Entrepreneur First in London. Uh, and their, their model is a little different than a lot of accelerators, like the accelerator here. They focus on the entrepreneur first, that's the name. And she, she was there essentially looking for a co-founder, kind of iterating between co-founders. They bring individuals in and then they match make. And they say like, you two work together kind of, and make a company. Uh, so she, was, she had this vision for what she wanted to do with her biology background uh, and she didn't find the right match there at the accelerator, so she reached out and found me. Through GFA. Exactly, yeah, okay, exactly. So, because uh, I was on, on their, you know, on their forums and such saying like, I'm looking for a co-founder, contact me. So we had an hour long conversation first, just kind of like intro to who we are. Uh, and I thought that's really interesting, what she's like, you know, her background and, and her pitch and her angle. And so I said, our next conversation should be about values, right? So we should ask ourselves like, why are you doing this? This is really hard, right? Uh, statistically, like uh, business or entrepreneurial ventures don't do really well. Right, so what's going to pull you through? Like, what does success look like? What does failure look like? So uh, at the time, I was actually like camping at Joshua Tree, uh, and literally when you right. were talking to her. Well, not when I was talking to her. Like, I talked to her like a week before, and I said like we're going to talk next week, and I was already planning on being in Joshua Tree. So I was like, okay. So I, I drove out of the park on a Sunday morning, like at eight in the morning, and I had to like walk onto a highway, like over on overpass on the highway to get reception and call her because she was in London, and we talked. We ended up talking like two hours. Uh, and you know, with the background or the, the traffic background, uh, and I was amazed at just like her perspective and the way she thought of the world. Uh, I had a, a, a path that I had like worked through personally to arrive where I was, and she had a very different path. She was influenced by effective altruism, which is just this idea of what is the most important thing you could do in your life. Like, if given your the skills, what how do you affect like, a grander vision or better vision for a world, right? So she was influenced by that. And so quickly we, we clicked, we gave each other some homework and we worked that out and then uh, I applied to the accelerator and flew out immediately to London. And so we were there for so a entrepreneur while. first. Yes, exactly. Oh, so you applied with her? She was already in it, so okay. in order for me to join, I had to apply as well. I so see. I had to apply, they had to interview me. They're like, come, come on over. So we did that and we actually started in, a clean meet, uh, in the clean meet space as kind of a horizontal player. Our idea being that we would provide you know, uh, products or services to the existing cleaning companies. So we signed NDAs, we talked to a bunch of cleaning companies, we, we looked at their labs, we, we talked about their vision, we talked about what they were doing, uh, and, and said, like, how can we fit into this? And so we iterated quite a, quite a while, like several months, on different models, different offerings. Uh, I should say the Good Food Institute was very helpful with okay. us in the very beginning. Uh, they they kind of like gave us a really good map of where the industry was and where we, where we could fit in. And we, we found that the space was very early, right? Uh, and we found a lot of the research was, was siloed, and we didn't find a critical mass of companies that were interested in working, working with us and providing that. Like, so there was certainly a few, and, but, but it's like, okay, are we gonna make our company on just these few? Um, what we eventually decided was that we needed a strong vertical player to pull all these disparate pieces together, like the pieces around the media, around scaffolding, around bioreactors. Uh, and then put product in the market, so to be a full vertically integrated company. Right. And so in about April, we decided this is us. So April of this year? Yep. April so this year. when did you first start talking to Andre? November 2017. In November? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so great. during those months, we kind of <clears throat> iterated around. You try, you, you, you find the product market fit, as they say. You keep talking to people. We had tons of interview, interviews, and the space is very supportive. So we, we interviewed like the, the co-founders or CEOs of several clean meat companies and other like synthetic biology companies that you would have heard of. Uh, and we also talked to like scientists and academics and you know, other, other media people and authors and things like that just to get a greater perspective of the space. So every day we had multiple interviews and we kind of synthesized that and, and think about like, what are we really, what, what's the value that we can offer and what, is the, what does the space need? So that's where we... Right. And that's right. cool. And so, uh, Entrepreneur First, there, were there any other entrepreneurs during the time that you guys were there also doing or pursuing clean meat companies? Yeah, there was one other one. Yeah. Okay. So we, and it was a pretty good relationship we had. So it was, they had a different differentiator. Like they were a full vertical company and we were a horizontal player. And so we, we were able to like work 
pretty pretty easily set aside. Yeah. Okay. Was that the higher stakes team? It is. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yep. Cool. Very yep. cool. So you mentioned GF ideas, or yep. just GFI in general, as being a, a huge resource for you guys. Right. What were some of the other resources that you guys used when really uh, doing research and making the decision to start a clean meat company? Yeah. So the uh, so GFI was helpful in the beginning, but also New Harvest was very helpful, uh, and then the Cellular Agriculture Society, so CAST, they, they formed a little later and they became very helpful. Uh, so we're, we're constantly amazed by the alignment of many of the companies in the space and the fact that, you know, I went to Finless Foods opening party and just so many other people were in the space and we just sit down and we just talk about, like, okay, what are you doing now? Like, okay, you need to do this. I'm going to connect you with this person. So it's a very mission aligned field. So being mission aligned ourselves, like why we why we are in this, we really have this you know, synergy that occurs. So that's really powerful. That's great. So so stepping back a little bit, um, when you were trying to find the the next thing to work on, mm -hmm. spend your time on, uh, what was the primary benefit of clean meat that attracted you to it? Yeah. So. Clean meat is it's kind of solves this rat nest of like multiple problems in one, right? It addresses climate change or the environment in general. It addresses human health. It addresses animal welfare. It also addresses food security. And then there's this fifth exciting thing, which is just what are we eating in the future? What are we going to eat on a space station, on Mars? Like there, there is an excitement and it's just a cool factor. So it has all these like really mission line things to make the world better, and also just the really cool side of like, oh my god, this is this is amazing. Right. So it's, it's fun. And so there was not another industry that I did a deep dive into that I was excited about. Like every time I, I dove into clean meat, I was just like, this is really cool. So yeah, that's why we it was, it was a no brainer. Like this is what we're doing. Great. So so you talked about that wall between like the product development and also kind of QA and testing. Mm -hmm. um, your background in automation, how is that uh, going to help cultured meat or clean meat technology uh, of new age meat in terms of automation and scaling? Definitely. The, it's interesting, our industry is very much like a, a derivative of human tissue engineering or human medicine, we'll say, pharma, biologics, things like that, therapeutics. So in that case, you have, for instance, so you will do, you will sell culture human cells for a burn victim, or maybe you have a heart, like a, a piece of heart muscle, right? So maybe you're, you have some heart problems, and we'll biopsy that person, grow the muscle in a lab, and then put it back in them, and when it goes back in them, it should stay in there for 20 years, right? So it, it needs to be highly functional, right? So it has to have like the blood vessels and the, the nerves and such like working in very precisely. So that means you have a very low volume and you have a very high cost, right? And high functionality as well. So this entire industry, multi-million dollar industry, has been geared toward those end goals. Whereas in our case, we have a very different need. So we need to do a very high volume and a very low functionality. The functionality we need is that it needs to taste good, right? It needs to have the right texture and aroma. It also should be healthy. So be healthier, in fact, than what's out there. So, and, then, and also we need to drop that cost down. So, when we were looking at, so I was here to come back to your automation question, there's entirely huge new white space that's really exciting about creating the cell lines that exhibit those characteristics, and then also making the media, which is what the cells eat, the media that will feed that. And then also on the scaling side, you have this, this scaling system, which is entirely different than the existing scaling system, which is again, low volume. So you need to make giant reactors, and then they have their own issues. So like, I have a background in chemical engineering, and so, I'm well aware of the issues that go into scaling and how a, a small size reactor doesn't necessarily behave as a large, large size reactor. And so automation, essentially what you need is you need to go through tons of experiments and you need to do them very rapidly and you do them in parallelization. And that's precisely my background. So I would go into research labs and I would say like, hey, you can go much faster and you could do multiple experiments at once or experiments at once and here's how you set them up. That's great. And so um, you're at IndieBio now. Uh, how has uh, how many weeks is the entire program? Uh, well, it's four months. It goes until November 9th. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's our demo day. So we'll be here at the Opera House and like be on stage, pitching okay. our clean meat company. Yeah. And, and you guys started around uh, mid July. Early July. July okay. 9th. July 9th. Yeah. Okay. So it's almost been a month that you guys have been here. Right. Has it been helpful? Um, and of course, um, is it? Would you consider that accelerators like IndieBio, and I know there's actually not very many, uh, pivotal for a company like yours? Yeah, so, so we had an entirely 
different path laid out. So we had early stage investors, we had labs, we had all the equipment, reagents and such, and we were ready to go down the path. And then IndieBio accepted us and we're like, wow, this is great. So we, we went down this, we went down the bio path and it's been pivotal, yes. Like we, we've saved a lot of money, first off, for all the equipment they have, uh, the reagents that they have available, and then the fact that they are, unlike a lot of other accelerators, we are down there, you, you, you walk down there into the, you know, there's a lab right beside the bullpen or the office area. We all work together and the team, the Indie Bio team sits down there with us. They're not in their own offices. They're, they're right there, which means if I have a question, I stand up and I walk over and, and they just say, oh sure, let's, so that's questions around the science, questions around the business, it's questions around, in our case, we're food, so, and they say, oh yeah, I can connect you to somebody. So the ability to really rapidly iterate and then be able to connect with the resources that we need, we get that here in a way that we honestly were extremely pleased with, it. and I'm surprised how effective it is. Right. Yeah. I'm not surprised, but I'm delighted. Delighted. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of times when we hear about accelerators, especially for tech, a lot of the the value weighs on the uh, the demo day, mm -hmm. the connections to investors. Uh, how do you, you know? Uh, of course, the demo day will be very exciting <coughs> for you guys. Uh, but you had mentioned you were already talking to some investors. How will Demo Day be important for you guys, especially since the clean meat space is, is so small at this time? Yes, yeah, so we, what IndieBio is good for, for us, I mean, it's good for a lot of things, but we, our plan is to create proof of concept. We are a food company. We're going to be creating pork sausages. That is our first product to market. And since we're a food company, it makes sense for us to make food. Right? So you could think like, well, we can make scientific milestones during this four month period, but really what we should be doing is making very tasty pork sausages for people. So we, right now, we have, in our labs downstairs, we have cells that are proliferating. Uh, we, we actually went to, the, the first week we were here, we went to a farm and we biopsied a pig. We took a very small biopsy from a pig uh, named Jesse. And the pig then ran off. The name of the pig the was, Jesse. Pig was Jesse. Yes. Okay. And Jesse is still alive. Jesse is very much alive. Right. Right. Jesse is okay. happy. Jesse has run off. We have pictures of Jesse uh, being being a happy pig. The little pig. Are those the pictures on the Twitter? No, those are okay. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Okay. Those, yeah. The, those it's are the a Twitter. cute pig. Yeah, it, it, they're adorable pigs, right? Yeah. Uh, but those are more like the ones on the Twitter are. I believe those are ones that are kind of like pet pigs. But this okay. is actually the pig that you eat. Right. right. We didn't want to biopsy a pet pig because people don't eat pet pigs. Right. You want the characteristics of taste, right? Taste and texture. So. Uh, we actually biopsy a pig that, that will be eaten at some point. Um, that's not our business. So, <laughs> we, uh, so we brought that biopsy back, and then you, you put in the, so right now, as I said, it's, it's down in our lab, and it's proliferating, it's dividing. And so at, in, a, in a couple months, we are going to be making the sausage out of that. And so then we say, like, hey, here's what we've done. So the idea of, of an accelerator is to go and do something, make some proof of concept. Like you're given a certain amount of money, you're given the space, go do something, right? So the thing we're doing is to create that, that pork sausage. And so when that's done, then, we're, then we invite investors that we've been speaking to to come in and taste it, or if we have enough of it, there's not gonna be a whole lot of it, it's very expensive. So we're, we're going to be able to have like a showing or a filming of that, and then we'll raise around on top of that. So demo day is, kind of, is going to be us showing that, uh, and it's also gonna be showing our progress both from the, the actual product, but then also from an automation perspective, which we spoke about, and then on our fundraising. Okay, so great. long answer to your question about what does Demo Day mean, so it means that we're just gonna, at that point, hopefully have been raising at that point, and then just give a status update. So we, we talked about some, uh, a, few, a few different things regarding cell line development, and then also serum. Uh, those are things that we hear that are challenges within the industry quite a bit. So first, maybe tell us exactly what cell line development means. When we say that, or even going after a cell line, what does that mean? That goes back to kind of one of the, the I said that our industry is kind of a derivative from <clears throat> like human cell engineering, right? And so the reason is when we say cell lines, so cell lines need to behave or they need to exhibit characteristics that are meaningful for the end product, right? In our case, like taste, texture, aroma, things like that, and being healthier. So we need to engineer those cell lines to be like that. So that's just through science. Uh, we're not even saying genetic modification, that's not what we're doing. We're simply using this, this automation platform in order to do a bunch of experiments. So essentially you're, you have different growth factors, for instance. So 
growth factors, you may be you know, insulin would be a growth factor, for instance. So how much insulin do you add? When do you add it? And then what is the temperature that you add it? And then what's the pH at that time? What's the osmotic pressure? And so you have tons of parameters that you can change to have an output. So how do you modify those parameters? And then you, you need to m measure those and go down, you ask these questions, and you essentially keep tweaking them and changing them, and you take a tremendous amount of data. So our automation platform allows us to take all that data and then do analysis on everything that happened afterward. So we're very inspired by other industries like math and engineering. Uh, in fact, I, I, I'm an engineer, obviously, uh, but I attended the New Harvest Conference a month ago, and you may have heard that there was a speaker there that said, this industry needs more engineers. You need to have people that make the systems. And so I, I, mean, I almost stood up and applauded, because he's right. Because as an engineer, you're able to not just take, because the, the, the scientist is kind of saying, can we do this at all? And then the engineer is saying, can we do this at scale in the right cost, at the right cost, right? So they're kind of like fact checking, if you will, uh, on the production side, right? So we're, we, and we're automating both the research and development and the production side. And again, dropping that barrier between the two. That's, again, it's been my background. Cool. Uh, so let's talk about growth. When, at least in Silicon Valley, when we think about growth of a startup, or we think about a very rapid growth, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone is trying to become the next unicorn billion dollar company. So demo day grows, goes great for you guys, let's say, and uh, you guys are ready to go into the next phase. How do you plan on managing that growth? And uh, what is really the, the, the plan for growth that you guys have? It's a great question. We are in, we're in a vehicle designed for growth. You are doing an investor-backed startup at an accelerator, right? So we believe, and why do we believe that? Well, it really goes back to us as co-founders, our mission, why are we doing this? Uh, and I kind of gave some reason, we gave the environmental impact, the human health impact, the climate change, or uh, sorry, the animal welfare, uh, food security, issues like that. So I believe that we are in an existential crisis around climate change, and we can take it slower. And I think in the beginning, we, we were also the mindset that like, this needs more open research and it needs a lot of like government funding and we need to be, and then I come here and I realize we can do all this research much, much, much faster. And because, because we, we are confronting a massive problem with that is self-accelerating. So if we move slowly, but the problem is moving faster, then we're not achieving our mission, right? So we need to move that fast. So when, when we raise our seed round, uh, that's when we're going to be hiring more. So we're hiring right now, in fact, hiring scientists. Uh, Put in that plug. Yeah. <laughs> PhD level. Said, yes, we are PhD level scientists that are familiar with stem cells and how they respond, how you culture them. Uh, very, we'd be very interested if you have that background. Uh, but we're going to be hiring more scientists and then more engineers and more data people, right? So we think data is going to be incredibly important to understand how to make these cell lines how to make the media to, to grow them in the right way, and then also how to scale them. So we're talking about data scientists, and later on machine learning people. So we're, we are very inspired by, as I mentioned before, this interdisciplinary approach, where we're taking the best from math, engineering, informatics, bioinformatics, uh, things like that, and bringing them all together. Great. Uh, so when, when clean meat is ready, how do you imagine that it'll be integrated into the market? Mm -hmm. Will it be a complete replacement? Will it be just another? You know, I was at Whole Foods the other day, and there's this whole aisle for meat and cheese alternatives, mm -hmm. right? Do you imagine that clean meat will just have its small little aisle at the Whole Foods or a grocery store, or do you think that it'll slowly start uh, really penetrating the, the market? Yeah, that's it. Something we thought a lot about, and we our go-to-market strategy is perhaps a little unique. We because what we want, we want to highlight, or at least address, um, the fear that consumers have, like what is this lab-grown meat? What is this Franken-meat, sometimes called? Uh, so there's a little fear around that. Um, people have a distrust of things like GMO, they have a distrust of things around science and their food. How do we address that? In our case, we are, our go-to-market strategy is actually to, we, we have to create a pilot plant, and the pilot plant is you know, scaling up the production from our research. We have the research, we scale up our production, then we go to full production. <clears throat> so at that scale, at that pilot plant, we will have a brewery. We're going to have a pork and beer brewery. So in... And beer. And beer, yeah. 
why beer, right? So to, 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 to paint a picture, we'll give tours, you will walk into our pork beer brewery, and on one side you'll see beer being made, and the other side you'll, be pork, you'll see pork being made. Why is that important? It's important because we want to overcome this fear that people have. So we, you think of something like beer. Beer, you don't dig up from the ground and you don't pick it from a tree. It's, it, you have raw ingredients, but then you use science and engineering to make something that you love. Right? You have actually have giant reactors that you maintain the pressure and the pH of, and, and you have them flow through channels. And it, but what comes out, people love. So we place, we place uh, our pork product right beside this thing that people are very familiar with. And it's going to be kind of a German theme, right? So you have uh, the, the beer and like a bratwurst. And so then you compare them together and realize that the same thing you love that created this, the science and engineering also creates this as well. Uh, and that's also, the, in that stage, that's also going to give, give us a really tight iterative loop between what the customer wants and our product, right? So it's direct to mouth. They're going to be right there. Uh, they're going to say like, do I like this or do I not like this? What about it do I like? It? What, what about the taste? What about the texture? And we can keep iterating right there, right? Uh, and then from there, we, we move into the market. That's our plan. Right. And I, I can't help to imagine, and I haven't been there, but mm -hmm. I heard Coca-Cola World in Atlanta okay. is like this crazy cool place right. where you walk in and there's uh, Coca-Cola being made yeah. and like a hundred different types of Coca-Cola that you could try. For some reason, I get that kind of vibe from it. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that's too tacky. I don't know. What, what you described sounded actually really cool, but so does Coca-Cola yeah. World. Yeah. So, uh, we, don't, we don't plan on being tacky. Okay. Uh, we, and probably won't be, it won't be the scale of Coca-Cola World. Right. Uh, it will definitely be smaller. Uh, and it's, it's not even, we're, trying to, we're not trying to make money at that point. We're trying to understand. Right? We're trying to perfect our processes and then understand what the consumers want. So it's a very you know, product-centric approach to, to creating uh, the clean meat. Cool, yeah. I think there's there's a lot of uh, craft breweries that have openings, and, and that, I think, is a, is, a, is a great way to get people in there and, and try the product. I think that that vibe that you described is very cool. Yeah. Uh, so the, I guess the next thing is that I, I want to talk about uh, two, different, two different things. One is different entrepreneurs that want to get into the industry and start either new companies that are really honestly direct competitors with yours mm -hmm. or even uh, their supplement the industry. And then I also want to talk about scientists that mm -hmm. are currently thinking about getting into the industry. Maybe they're doing stuff with the medical uh, tissue culture right now and they're considering getting into this type of clean meat technologies. Uh, what advice do you have for the scientists or entrepreneurs thinking about clean meat? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, we need all the scientists and engineers we can. We can get into this industry. We need to shift interest. So, for instance, let me give you an example. Uh, on the bioreactor side, which will be the scaling, uh, there are there are bioreactor companies right now that are making a low volume of cells for human tissue engineering, like, like, like we talked about before. And we're going to call with them, and they say, "Hey, we see this entirely new industry, entire new industry popping up, uh, but we don't know a whole lot about it. We're going to be making a different scale. Will you work with us?" Um, and so we're shift, what's happening is we're shifting people's or companies' normal path, or let's say normal, but what they focus on so far, uh, the, the market that they're focused on. And then as we get more companies in here, they say, hey, there's an entirely different market. And we can shift our production to that. And we have years of experience in that. So this bioreactor company is really good. They have very good IP. They have a lot of skills in-house. And, and they said, we're really excited. Like, you're, you're like the only company that we've spoken to that really like, gets what we're trying to do. Uh, and so we're looking to actually exclusive license with them to do that. So that's really cool. Uh, so that that would be more on the why we need more engineers and scientists to come into the space. Uh, and then how do they do it? I think, I, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, there is a, you know, kind of the trope out there, just like follow your passion or do what you love. Uh, but it's, it's kind of what I was saying earlier, is there's really, it's one leg and a three leg school, three legged stool, right? What do you love? And then what are you good at? And then what does the world need? Or what does the market need? So in other words, like, who's going to pay you for this? Right? There are a lot of things that you can love to do and that you're good at, but then there's no real market for it. Uh, so this, there's a massive market for, for what we're doing. Uh, we've, we've specifically chosen pork for a number of reasons, but one of them because it's the most consumed meat in the world. Uh, it's half of the world's population. In fact, that eats pork, actually 60% of the world's population eats pork is in Asia, which is the fastest growing population on Earth. 
and a lot of people that are coming out of poverty and eating more meat. So that's why we chose uh, this product first. Uh, a lot of other reasons as well. So, yeah. So it's for the scientists and for the entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So why get into it? Or well, I guess um, we we I guess it, when you're in the clean meat space, you want other people to to jump in and start working on different technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you have any advice for them to uh, entrepreneurs that are thinking about it? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So it goes back to what I was saying earlier in that the space is really mission aligned. Uh, ask yourself why you're doing it. Uh, we, we need everybody, so everybody's going to have their reason, and we have, and we can, it's, as you, you talk to different entrepreneurs and scientists around the world, they actually have entirely different, in a lot of cases, reasons that they do it, right? So the people in Japan are, have a different, very different reason than the people in Israel, than the people here, than the people in Amsterdam. Uh, and so find out what it is that resonates with you. And then speak that openly, right? Just like say like why I'm doing this, and then bring other people into the movement for that reason. Um, and you'll find you'll find partners everywhere, right? We are more than happy to work with people that have like different reasons for coming into it, but also have the same vision. So understand, uh, have a vision, think about it, and then bring people on board to to get there. Cool. Uh, so now that you are uh, into the deep into the industry, what were some things that you learned that really surprised you? When we started speaking to, well, we, we've spoken with tons of you know, researchers uh, and other companies. So we find that a lot of the research that's being done is in this very academic, bespoke manner. Uh, you'll often, oftentimes people come out of research academia and they continue in a very academic methodological process of evaluation. Uh, and that's good, but it's slow. And so we were, we were I don't want to say surprised, but we definitely we gained that insight working with these companies that like, hey, uh, one is my engineering background that, that showed me that, but also Andra, my co-founder, she her PhD is in interdisciplinary biosciences. So the idea that you can be using these other really revolutionary technologies uh, around data science, around engineering, around scaling that haven't yet been used here in clean meat. There's an entirely huge white space, like I was saying earlier, of, of possibility. Uh, and so we were struck that we, there was a focus on just a few cell lines uh, and then a few permutations of that. And, I, and we just said like, there's just so much that can be done. Uh, and it, again, that's why we need more interested scientists. Like when we say like, if, if you think like, well, there are a few big players and they kind of have it wrapped up, so we should be good. It's just, it's just not true. It's like the, the era of like, the Model T. When the Model T came out, Henry Ford, we didn't say like, oh, looks like you got the whole car thing figured out, so let's find something else to do. We have a massive industry just around transport, right? And in, in this way, we have, we'll have a massive industry around meat, but not just meat, just like food. Right? Why, why do we eat what we eat? Where does it come from? What, we have food now that makes us unhealthy and unhappy, and that's disastrous to the environment and to animals. Like, how can we make a more sustainable system? There are so many more things that we can't explore. Uh, so that was, that was what we struggled with. Cool. So you can get in touch with uh, Brian on LinkedIn, and you guys have a, a sign-up page on newagemeats.com right now. So definitely check that out. And a little bit about IndieBio, how does one learn more about IndieBio? Of course, it's IndieBio.com. Uh, when .co. is like the next .co? Right. Oh, sorry, IndieBio.co. Yeah. When is the next uh, batch start? That's a good question. They, our demo day is on November 9th, and I believe they have you know, a couple months in between to kind of let us get out, uh, clear, clear the pipes, and then get the new system in there, uh, or the new cohort in. Uh, you should check the website. I'm not quite sure. Um, Okay, that's indiebio.co. Yes. Okay, right. Right. Um, we'll, we'll open it up to any questions that we had. Um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll cut the feed and then see if any questions came in and then pop it back on. Great. Uh, so once again, I want to say before we, we cut uh, the live feed, thank you so much for being with us today. Sure. Yeah, cool. Awesome. So uh, let's, uh, let's see what questions they came in and see what we can answer.